We're excited to share some important things with you today. So we're just going to jump right in, and Jeff Stewart will get us started. Okay. It's good to be here with all of you. Um, we had a client uh, one time, uh, a lady that we worked with. She wrote us a letter, and she said, I came to the realization that uh, last week that the effects of pornography um, has had on my marriage will show up from time to time when I least expect it. I liken pornography in my home to having a house infested with termites. The termites come in slowly and start to eat away at the foundation. The occupants of the house see the sawdust left behind and sweep it up wondering what it was from. Over time, more damage is done and the floors become unsteady and uneasy from the feet, uh, under the feet of the occupants. Finally, one day, when it's least expected, the floor gives way, leaving the occupants hurt, afraid, scared, angry that their home could be so infested without them knowing it. The hole is patched, and different ways of ridding the termites are brought in. Each new idea brings a surge of hope that surely this new poison will fix the problem. From time to time, the, the occupant, she falls through the floor once again, and once again has to repair the damage and try once more to rid the termites. Finally, the occupant can't take it anymore and reaches out to a professional exterminator. They finally have the answer on how to get rid of the termites. The occupant rejoices in finally knowing what to do. The problem is solved with a little grit and ingenuity, and over time the house is free of termites. And then she says, What I now realize is that I might be living in a termite-free house, but the unseen damage has already been done. You still never know when the floor is going to give out. From under you, this is what I am left with. Extreme joy and gratitude to have found tools to combat this problem, this evil, and the realization that I still live in an unstructurally safe home. The beams in the floors have been weakened and I still don't feel safe. I go on living my life and then suddenly plummet. The thought of living this way for the rest of my life is very unsettling and depressing. Okay, so we're going to be talking about how pornography obviously impacts people and we have to get beyond this idea that if a person just stops looking at pornography, everything's okay. And we have to understand that a person uh, continues to use pornography as an addiction because there are these weaknesses. There is more than just betrayal happening in families and marriages that are affected by this plague. And uh, I want to show a little video that helps us understand that we have to get past the just stop it mentality to truly understand the weaknesses and pains of individuals that are struggling with this so that we can more fully help them and, and bind the wounds that have made them vulnerable to this plague. So uh, how many of you know who Bob Newhart is? And uh, we're going to introduce you to him uh, playing the role as a therapist. Okay, so we can see from that kind of the madness of a person that has already tried stopping time and time again, and it's more difficult than that, and we have to go deeper in understanding what the root of the problem is. And another challenge with the just stop it mentality is a lot of the times uh, partners, uh, church leaders, well-meaning friends, family members, other, other people focus on just trying to extinguish problematic behavior, and they ignore the fact that there's so much more like the termites that have been affected by this problem. And so if we only emphasize brief, just getting rid of the bad behavior stuff, then we, we leave the, uh, the individual and those around them affected by so much more that's not being talked about. Pornography and the way it affects a family is a lot like a spider web. In my, uh, in my career of uh, working with pornography addiction, uh, with partners, uh, family members, addicts, um, the different areas that it focuses on, that it touches, it, it touches family, of course. It, it touches uh, their, their basic physiologies, you know, sleep, diet, all those kinds of things. It affects emotions, attachment. Um, it oftentimes brings up abandonment and trauma issues, um, even larger cultural issues, gender, all kinds of things. This, this issue touches on so many different areas, and, and uh, if we just do a superficial treatment of it by trying to focus on behavior, we miss uh, so much more of the problem. And so one of the challenges with pornography, though, is that it blinds us. And uh, Wendy Maltz, who's written extensively on pornography addiction, says that using pornography can make you go blind. 
blind to the power and control it can eventually have over your life. Though we might stare intensely at it, we don't see, often can't see, how and why it is so powerful. And so if you are someone that struggles with pornography addiction, you have blind spots. You have to understand that. And if you're someone that's been affected by someone that has struggled with pornography, it's very easy to buy into those blind spots and believe that this is not as big of a deal as it really is. Now, I'm certainly not trying to make something more than it needs to be, but I oftentimes run into the, to the minimizing that happens, and it leaves people delaying getting the help they need and having the conversations they need to have to really solve the bigger issue. And some of the individual effects of pornography, uh, primarily they were studied with uh, severe types of pornography um, that is uncommon, like rape pornography or S&M type of pornography. And they found that with those types of pornography that it affected people, especially the social part of the brain where they would objectify people. But there, and this is an important piece that it's important for all of you to understand. There's been a kind of a turn in the research where the more common everyday run of the mill pornography that people and even scientists even would say that was not harmful is being found to be more harmful and, and having the same effects that the severe types of pornography would have. And that's important to understand. And some of these individual effects that pornography has been found to have on individuals, um, as you look at the list, what you're going to notice is the, the areas that are being affected the most are the areas where we relate with other human beings. Don Hilton has done uh, some fantastic work. Don Hilton is a, a neurosurgeon, and he's done some work understanding that the, basically the relationship center of the brain is the most adversely affected part of the brain just by the run-of-the-mill, uh, some people would even call it softcore type of pornography. Do you want to go through any of these? Uh, just kind of... And notice, notice the relationship that each of these have with relationships. Decreased belief that relationships can be long-term. Increased risk of becoming sexually dissatisfied. Normalizing casual sex. Um, Mark did a great job today of really helping us understand how pornography is truly aimed at destroying families. And um, one of the parts that it affects the most is the mind and that part of the brain that helps us to be sensitive, understanding, and aware of the people closest to us is the part that's affected the most with uh, any type of pornography. And you know, when we're treating this issue in our, in our clinic, a lot, of the, a lot of the individuals we work with, um, it takes them time to be able to understand and realize how all these areas are being affected. And we find that the longer that they have away from pornography, the sobriety, as we might call it, from pornography and sexual acting out actually frees them up to be able to start to comprehend and understand all of this collateral damage. And, and that's why, you know, the second, third year of recovery of sobriety is, in my opinion, one of the most productive and, and fulfilling and enriching for, for marriages and families because this is when they finally get him back or her back if it's a, if it's a female addict. Um, and and these, are the, these are the areas that uh, are not only affected, but also heal. And there's a few more. There's research that shows that um, you know, men, men by, by and large, are the, uh, are the biggest consumers of uh, uh, internet pornography. And there's studies that show that men that consume pornography are two times more likely to meet the uh, symptoms for depression. And men experience depression differently than women. Often we think of depression as someone who's just sad and you know, lost his motivation, and that certainly, are, that certainly is depression, no question about it. But by and large, where women turn in when they're depressed, men actually turn out and become much more aggressive, irritable, moody, um, and experience very different uh, symptoms of this. And so, what we want to talk about for just a minute is the individual impact of pornography for a man is going to increase his depression. And this becomes a chicken egg thing, you know, which caused it. Was he depressed and then went to pornography or, or did he uh, become depressed from looking at pornography? And oftentimes it's both. 
And so here are some of the things that we see with men who struggle with depression. And see if this looks like a lot of the symptoms you see in some of the men that you know or even yourself if you're here and, and struggling. Um, to blame, to be irritable and hostile, uh, putting a lot of the responsibility back on the partner, on his wife, uh, guarded, suspicious, demanding, perfectionistic, anger outburst. Alexithymia is, is a, a word that means you don't have words for emotions or feelings, so you don't even know how to talk about what you feel, which I think most men struggle with this. Culturally, we're not given permission to talk about how we feel. A lot of shame and cr self-criticism and uh, over-medicating and poor judgment. And um, again, just stopping pornography isn't going to magically alle alleviate these symptoms or the damage from living with somebody who's lived like this. And so there's a lot of relationship repair and a lot of individual repair to do to be able to help you come out of this. If, 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 it's, two, if it's two times more likely, chances are if you've struggled with pornography, you've struggled with depression. And certainly going against your values is uh, depressing for anybody. Okay, one thing that we uh, notice in talking with spouses and family members of uh, those who are addicted to pornography is that they are constantly barraged with double messages from this individual. Um, one of the principles in psychology is uh, the emotion or feeling that we show the most is the one that we are hiding. It literally seeps from us. And all of us have experienced this. When, when we have come home or we walk into a room with a, a very good friend or a loved one or family member, and without words, we walk in the room and we can just feel like something is going on. And we might even ask them and say, hey, you know, are you okay? Is something going on? And they might tell us with their words that, hey, no, nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. And uh, the reality is because those individuals who are struggling with this addiction and the depression that is going on, they're constantly sending mixed messages that with the many women that we have met with, they have told us how crazy making that is for them as a spouse who wants to help, can tell there's something wrong, asks, and the individual has that alexithymia type of response where they don't have words to describe what they're going through, and nothing gets done. One of the most important things that individuals have to learn as they're in recovery is to put words to what they're feeling, to make the inside feeling and experience that they have match what they're doing on the outside with what they're saying and doing. And this is, this is a good representation of what that is like for spouses and family members, that constant double message that they get from the individual who is suffering. Do I see more about that? On this slide here. And um, one thing that, one pattern that we see a lot with uh, couples is, do you have the little laser? Uh -huh. Is, we call it the switcheroo pattern, where uh, wife, and as anyone that has worked with these women know that um, they have like this intuitive sense, almost like a sixth sense. They just know when something has happened. And they just feel it in their bones, some women say. Some women uh, feel like it's a spiritual type of impression that's given from their higher power. They just feel that something is going on. And they approach their spouse, especially in, it's uncanny how quickly it is after a person has acted out. They approach them and they say, hey, tell me, are you OK? I just have this sense that something happened. One thing that's very hard for addicts to do is to come out of hiding, though. They have a reflex to hide in almost every case. And so when they are approached by this, they hide, and they basically kind of pull a switcheroo and say to the spouse, what's wrong with you? And what happens at that point is the addict will make the case of what's wrong with her, and you know, nine times out of ten, that wife will walk away from that conversation with a laundry list of what she needs to be doing better. If you notice one of the slides before, one of the things that 
uh, Jeff mentioned about with men in depression is they blame others for their problems. And that's obviously what an addict does as well. And the first person that feels the weight of that is the wife. And so deepening the discussion about how an individual tolerates the pain of uh, a spouse that comes forward and, and talks about difficult things is an important part of uh, every individual's recovery. Do that video now. Okay, so um, we're going to show a, a quick little video about uh, what it's like to get those double messages all the time. So in this video, you're going to see a man. This was a, this was a section of a video that was produced by the LDS Church uh, called Watch Your Step. And we took a section out of it, and we cut the sound out. So you could just watch the split screen of this individual and, and the, du the dual life that he's living. So just notice what happens as you're watching the two lives. So as you watch that, I hope that you paid attention to, and maybe you know it uh, personally, that feeling of all the alarm bells going off telling you there's something wrong and the other person almost acting oblivious to it. It's very difficult. And the, the tool of uh, learning to become self-aware of what that person is feeling is, is extremely important because what pornography does is again, it, it cuts that person off from that social part of their brain that when that part is cut off, they start treating people as objects. And um, basically, they're using people to get what they want, which is very addict style behavior. So pornography, uh, just really briefly, pornography is involved in sort of there's the object, who the person who's in the pornography being viewed and the person watching it is what we would call the subject. And so when the person watching it is watching an object, what happens in the brain is it basically t it, it, it creates an experience in the user, and they've studied this, where the person watching the pornography is viewing that person, and this, the, the brain is reacting to that person almost as if they were like a tool or something that they need to do something to. It's not to connect with. And so basically it desensitizes them, and the person's not fully human anymore that they're watching. So the subject their message for the subject is you need to act on an object or act on something. And you can see where somebody who's desensitized themselves and trained themselves and conditioned themselves by viewing pornography over and over and over again, and even since adolescence or childhood, is going to basically see people as objects or people that, you know, what can you do for me? Or you're in my way. Or I, I don't really care how you feel or I can't care how you feel. And that objectification goes way beyond sexual objectification. It kills relationships. And that's a lot of healing that has to happen long term, is learning how to connect to people in a real way. Okay, let's get that one. So, um, Stephen and Real Croshaw shared this analogy with me, and I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, they talk about, we talk about how people that, individuals that are struggling with pornography are a lot like a tractor being stuck in the mud. And um, the tendency for a lot of individuals that struggle with this problem is, you know, when, they're, when they finally realize that they're stuck, they oftentimes will just stay inside the cab and keep pushing gears and pedals and trying to just, you know, get themselves unstuck. And we all know that in order to get a tractor stuck out, unstuck out of the mud, it involves 
lots and lots of people. is going to fix the problem. It requires a community of people. Mark Laser um, says that every man that struggles with pornography needs to have five to ten other men that know his story. And that can be 12-step group members, it can be uh, group therapy, therapists, church leaders, family members, and so we want to surround individuals that struggle with these kinds of supports and that's how people heal. That's one of the most powerful interventions early on in recovery. Um, I've met with so many addicts who uh, throughout their life they've struggled with this and they've only talked to one or two people about that struggle. Sometimes you'll meet someone in their 40s or 50s before they actually come out into the light. And um, it's, a, it's a difficult step but one that's very essential. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like for a woman to constantly be getting the double messages from a spouse who's addicted to pornography. And I want to make note that um, even an individual who looks at pornography infrequently, the, the porn use may be zero at the time, but this kind of way of doing relationships, unless they are in recovery learning a different way, is constantly going on. It's kind of like the whole uh, idea of being a dry drunk. They might be drunk, but they're still acting like an addict. And so, um, so what I want to talk about is a few of these effects that, um, that we can uh, focus on. One of the things that we learned from Sue Johnson is that the people who are closest to us are the hidden regulators of our lives. And basically that means uh, if someone that I'm walking by down the street kind of gives me a bad look or something, it's not really going to impact me that much. But if I'm getting ready to go for work and my wife gives me a bad look before I leave, that's going to impact me. And I'm going to be thinking, wow, what, what, what happened between us? We definitely are, uh, in families, we are the people that not only can hurt each other the most, but we can also help each other the most. And it's because we are the hidden regulators of the other person. What we do affects the other person. So women will feel things from their husbands um, that go far beyond just knowing about his secrets. So here's some of the uh, symptoms that these women have shown that are kind of affected by these double messages all the time. Obviously relational trauma, uh, self-blaming. He's, he constantly tells me that nothing is wrong and gives me this laundry list of what I need to be doing better. So these women are obviously very self-blaming and they suffer from sometimes a very poor self-image. Um, and some women take it upon themselves to kind of, they work harder at their spouse's life than the spouse who's struggling with pornography and so they begin to police that spouse. In some cases there are situations where there's STDs that are uh, a result. The isolation, um, one thing that's necessary for a person to be there for the other is there has to be a give and take of sharing that in interpersonal world and an addict has a very difficult time doing that and so it inhibits their spouse and family members from being able to talk about what's going on inside. And there's, there's numerous other type of things. That one of the other sad ones is when women feel like they have to compete with pornography and so they may have a tendency to do cosmetic surgeries and it's meaningful to know not only does Utah have the highest pornography rate in the country Utah also has the highest rate of plastic surgery among women in the country there's a relationship there that these uh, marriages are struggling with um, obviously there's uh, eating disorders that can happen that are characteristic for many women and many women also suffer a spiritual crisis because they'll go to their 
church leaders and talk about what's going on. And the picture that that church leader gets from the wife is very uh, desperate and destructive. And then they'll bring the, hu the husband in, and the husband basically kind of just shines the, the church leader and makes the wife look crazy. And um, so there's uh, not only a spiritual crisis that these women face with because they're sometimes cut off from their spiritual leaders. So one thing about living with uh, the presence of a pornography addiction, a lot of the times, like Jeff said, there's double messages. There's the, I, you know, I feel this way about you or this is how it's going, but then they learn the truth. You know, Mark Scherliff talked about um, how awful it was for that uh, that one officer to have to let a woman know about her husband's double life. Well, somebody who's living with another person who struggles with addiction, they're, they're dealing with this double life and wondering what's real all the time. We're going to show you a quick video clip um, that I, I think really it kind of shows or demonstrates what it's like to have that switch, to have that, that betrayal, that trauma of what you think is going to happen doesn't really happen and what it's like to live that. And imagine what it's like for her body to want to be able to get back with this person after this event happens. And, um, and you'll notice in your own bodies when you watch it what it feels like. You may want to write down all the double messages that you hear in this little video. How many double messages did you notice? You know I love you. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. Did she look like she wanted to? So just imagine, just imagine, and I'll, you know, I don't know them or where they ended up, but I understand they did break up after that. They claim it had, <laughs> they cl she claims it had nothing to do with that, but I don't really believe that because you can imagine what's stored in her body about what she trusts or believes from this person, that this person is going to say one thing but do another. That's coded very deeply. And in partners that are betrayed by pornography addiction, even just from the very basic fidelity of I do or I'll be faithful to you, and then this happens and they get that switch, the body codes that very deeply. So partners work is about helping them learn how to live with this constant fear and re of, of when am I really going to know what's real, what is real. It's a very stressful thing for partners. And so if we're helping partners as friends, family members, church leaders, we cannot minimize the impact that this has on their bodies and their emotions and make them feel like, well, just forgive he's a good person, or let's just move along, or why are you still bringing this up? We have to give them space and they have to do the work. It's just as much work for a partner to learn to trust again as it is for a guy to learn how to be healthy from an addiction. They both have so much work to do to get back together. Yeah, it's called Boyfriend Pushes Girlfriend Off Cliff. <laughs> they should make a second part that girlfriend breaks up with boyfriend one week later. So anyway, um, yeah, you can get that on YouTube. And there's more to it. We clipped it down just a minute long. So it shows him laughing at her, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty rough to watch. But um, OK. So for a partner, a lot of women, though, because they're, they're married, they're bonded to their husbands, they've made this commitment, they oftentimes will jump into the mud and want to pull him out themselves. But these good women need help and support. They cannot do this alone. And so a lot of women go into isolation, too, basically um, thinking that it's just our little problem. We need to figure it out. And they're, they're embarrassed to talk to other people about it. So ladies and those who help the, the women that are, that are impacted by this, we have to surround them. We have to get resources and give her the, the strength and support. Again, we're big fans of groups, 12-step groups, therapy groups, having women also build a support network so that they don't feel crazy and that they can hear stories from other women and get the support they need. Um, getting unstuck like a tractor, and in this case a horse, requires a team effort. And it is so important to, um, to validate what their emotional world is like. So many of these women go for so long in their marriage with their spouse not validating their emotions. And so one of that, that can be one of the biggest tools is to talk to women and ask them what this is like for them. One of the main reasons they are hurting the most is because they're in a marriage where their spouse takes all their emotional world and pain and hurt to an addiction. And if you look at that picture here, I want you to kind of uh, pretend that each one of those boxes holds food for that marriage to thrive and grow and develop and strengthen. And when an addict closes up and has no 
tools to be able to access those you know, pains and hurts and, and joys in their life because they take it to their addiction, that marriage is literally withheld and malnourished. And the women feel that the most because they have naturally this instinct to know and to feel and want to be attuned and share those deeper parts of their marriage and their family life. But when an addict is kind of leading a double life, taking it somewhere else, it creates tremendous distance where uh, it's crazy making for the wife because she has all these kind of things that she wants to work out and talk about, and he never does. And so it's a huge imbalance in the marriage. They're not equally yoked and giving, giving each other permission to feel about different things that are going on in that marriage and family. We're going to wrap up here with talking about the impact on children. And we're not just talking about children who view pornography. We're talking about children who live in families where pornography is an issue for the, one of the parents. And again, in most cases, it's the dad. Um, we often think that you know, children, when they're little, like what they, what they don't know or what they can't see won't hurt them. But children, like Mark Shirtliff talked about, they're little sponges, and their whole world is emotional. And when there's any ripple or any change in the emotional system in the family, children feel it. I mean, children can even feel when you're unavailable on the telephone and, and they become more clingy or demanding. They're very sensitive to the emotional climate. Here is uh, Schneider's research on 10 different outcomes we see um, by children whose parents, or one, one parent looks, is addicted to pornography or, or sexual acting out. The biggest one is decreased parental time and attention. They're consumed, again, like we talked about, there's this disconnect. They view people as you know, less than human, so oftentimes, like in that video you saw, there's just a lot of disconnect, checking out. I mean, this is happening on a bigger scale, with even with just electronic devices these days, with electronics addictions. But with pornography, there's just such a lack of attunement and connection to children. And, um, and there are these other, other effects, too, that we see as well. Um, but the biggest, the biggest loss we see is... Um, being pulled into the parents' emotional drama, and then sensing something's going on, but nobody's telling them what's going on. And we're not encouraging parents just to run to all their children, uh, you know, preschoolers and elementary age kids or even teenagers, and say, Dad has a pornography addiction. We're not suggesting that. But we are suggesting that it's critical to talk to children about the emotional climate Mom and I are really struggling right now. Things are just tough right now. You've probably felt some things that are off, or you've noticed that mom's been tearful. You know, dad, dad and mom have, are, are really struggling, or dad's done some things to hurt mom. It's important to validate um, what they're feeling already. Two tools to use when you're discussing how much to tell children is, number one, how well can that child keep a confidence? How well can they keep and, and talk to the safe people about what they're going through, what their, parent, what their family is going through. And second, how much can that child emotionally process? What age are they at? All, and it's difficult to say by numeric age because <coughs> all of us who have children know that some children are less mature than their age and some children are more mature than their age. But it takes a healthy discussion to kind of find that point. You want to do the audio? Yeah, so uh, the next thing that we're going to uh, let you listen to is a 18-year-old client that I worked with um, over the past three to four months. And one of the things that he's going to talk about is his father's addiction and how that affected him. So when he was 14 years old, he walked in on his father looking at pornography. And for four years, he kept that secret, not telling anybody until he came to therapy. And I want you to notice um, what he, he, you're actually going to hear him describe what that was like for him. And this is him as an 18-year-old talking about four years ago. But notice the double messages. Notice how he speaks about his father who can't really deal with relational issues and pushes them off onto the mother. When I was 14 years old, I stayed up late. Um, in my house, and I, th I caught my dad looking at porn, at least uh, it looked like it, and then when I confronted him about it, he told me, like, he said he wasn't, and 
he made up some excuse and and then uh like a year later I actually caught him in the act and he said he'd stop and everything like that but he didn't and and it's just affected me my family negatively the whole time I feel like he's I don't know more distant emotionally from the family he doesn't he, he's not there for most of us he's always he's either when he's not at work he's either sleeping or on his iPhone and it's just so stressful I feel like he pushes all the all, all the problems that he that in, he encounters on someone else mostly my mom and, so much trouble. We try to help. Okay, you could feel the pain in this uh, in this young man's life. And another quick uh, example. This is from a 13-year-old girl that I worked with. She didn't know her her uh, father had a pornography addiction until the divorce happened, and she tried to forgive. And she, this is what I, I asked her to. Uh, draw a picture. She was a very creative person, and so I wanted to give her an avenue to kind of express what it was like for her to be with her father. So I just said, draw a picture for me of you and your dad in, in the room together. And this is what she drew, or painted, actually. Um, and she feels like she wants to forgive. Everything inside her thinks it's just black and white to forgive, um, but she can't, because he's just so disconnected from her. And when she's with him, it feels like there's this snake or serpent always behind her. She feels kind of creepy. And so there's, there's research also that shows, just really quickly, that uh, children already know. 60 out of 89 respondents in one study said they already knew about their parents' behavior, even though the parents didn't think they did. So if you don't say anything, you're going to make your kids crazy. And you don't necessarily need to go into any details, but you need to acknowledge that they are dealing with emotions that they can feel in the family. We're going to wrap up reviewing the three areas that we talked about as far as the more than just betrayal, helping those who struggle individually. Um, like we talked about with the tractor analogy, we have to connect them to other people and to resources, get them educated so that they can understand. One thing I love about 12-step groups and group therapy is that they get to hear other people's stories and it helps them develop empathy and educate and understand what might be happening to those around them. And the more they read about these things, it gives them more of an, uh, of an understanding of what impact it's had on them and on their family members. And it increases their ability and their desire to commit and be motivated to do whatever it takes to heal. Okay, so for helping partners, uh, again, one of the biggest things that we can do is validate their in internal world experience by connecting with them, talking with them, helping women get their voice back and, and know that they aren't crazy. One of the things that is helpful the most to these women is just again and again affirming, you're not crazy. You've, you've kind of been in this marriage or family that's constantly been giving you mixed messages and it feels crazy making, but you are not crazy. Advocating for them and helping them uh, access help from their church leaders or family members too often, and it's getting better, but too often when uh, a marriage comes out struggling with this addiction, everybody focuses on the addict. And uh, at times the wife is kind of left in the back seat or even not even in the car at all. So we have to validate for them and give them avenues to be educated, books, um, groups where they can learn from other women and how they're being affected, and give them direction. And, directing them to safe places where they can get help. 12-step meetings are amazing. SA Lifeline, um, therapy, and group therapy. If you're a family member, this is uh, some stuff that Jill Manning found in her research. 
you can see the two columns there, helpful responses and unhelpful responses. If you're a family member of somebody that's impacted, whether you're a family member of a wife of an addict or an addict or both or, or an adolescent, um, we want you to be present with them, be a, a support to the whole family, to the whole marriage, not take sides. Recognize that there's a lot more going on than you probably understand. So I think it's good to take kind of the one down, open up and share if you have any similar experiences and don't stay in hiding. See if you can connect and validate as well. And respect the, uh, the, the process. Okay, so for children, um, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with kids who have said, I tried to tell my teacher, I tried to tell my, my home teacher, I tried to tell my aunt or my uncle, and uh, basically what happened is they just kind of said, oh, well, that's too bad, and they didn't really say anything. They didn't say to that child, what your dad or your mom is doing is wrong, and we need to get them help. They didn't confront it. They just kind of let it pass by. They didn't think it was their place to go and have a discussion. You know, if this was any other type of drug, we would totally, uh, you know, bring in the tanks, so to speak, to help this child. And uh, acknowledging that what is happening is wrong and that they can get help is so important. Bringing that support and teaching them the truth, like Mark was talking about earlier this morning, about the truth about what human sexuality is and isn't. And inviting them and their parent, whoever it is that is struggling, to get help. We don't want, a lot of people that are struggling with this use darkness for light, meaning when problems come to the surface, they kind of start, put it back down beneath the surface and they think, oh, well, they, they can just handle that. That's a private family issue. The principle that we see that helps couples and families get better the most is the more light that we can put on it, the more people who are safe and who, are, who it's necessary to tell that do know, that can help, the, the quicker the recovery and healing process is. If you're, if you're an individual um, here today who struggles with pornography or your family's been affected by this and you have children in your home, we encourage you to invite your children to talk about what it just feels like to be in the family and make that a regular thing. And, and, and you may find that they feel emotions and things that, that make them uncomfortable. You want to keep that invitation open so that they have a safe way to talk about how they feel, even though they may not know. Again, those we love regulate our bodies and our emotions, and so they're feeling things. So to, to wrap up today, we, uh, we recognize that talking about this and trying to expand the scope of the problem can sometimes feel overwhelming and maybe even a little bit depressing. But we believe that understanding the nature of the problem also gives us a chance to really solve it and do good work, more thorough work, which then helps free individuals, partners, and families from the, uh, the impact of pornography. Thank you so much.